First, I want to thank the Center for Latin American Studies for giving me the opportunity to um, be able to share the results of my research on ethnic land titling in uh, Latin America. Uh, this uh, presentation is part of my dissertation project, which focuses on why certain state elites, like presidents, title ethnic lands uh, in some places and at certain times, but not others, and how I learned about their motivations. Um, ethnic land titling varies considerably across countries, as you can see in this uh, graph, and within countries. So the motivating research question is, what explains ethnic land titling patterns both across and within countries? On average, Latin American states title about 11% uh, of the territory as ethnic land. We have in the extreme Colombia with 33% followed by Nicaragua, and all the way to the other side, we have Belize. Now today I'll talk about Nicaragua, and I'll also talk about Brazil. Um, my dissertation includes a study on Honduras, but we can talk about that aspect of it um, in the Q&A se uh, section of the talk. Now, before I go on, let me explain what ethnic, th ethnic land titling is, how I defined it. Um, and for that, I have to tell you a little bit about ethnic communal property rights. So ethnic communal property rights, or what I call ECPR, are formal institutions or laws that govern land access and tenure that applies to members of state-recognized ethnic groups. So we usually think of these institutions as a bundle of four rights. The right to access, use, manage, or exclude people from a, a territory, from a land. States differ in the amount of bundle or the sticks in the bundle that they recognize to indigenous groups. But importantly, ECPR um, do not include the right to mortgage the land, the right to sell the land, or the right to transfer the land to ethnic outsiders because the whole purpose of it is to maintain the land within the ethnic group. Now, ethnic land titling, or um, technically the implementation of formal ECPR, happens when the state actually grants a land title uh, to groups on the basis of, 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 of autochthony or ethnicity by issuing a presidential decree or uh, an official property title. Now, some of you might ask yourselves, well, who cares about ethnic land titling and why are we spending our time here? Well, their ethnic land titling is central for a very uh, important uh, political phenomenon. The literature on state building uh, takes ethnic land tiling as part of the technology of power and as a tool of the state to incorporate previously neglected regions into the modern state. The literature on political order argues that ethnic land tiling serves as a flexible solution to manage ethno-national conflict and that it's a part of an institutional infrastructure that uh, compartmentalizes conflict at the local level. Economists have told us that ethnic land titling restricts marketization and stifles economic development in the long run. And on the other hand, the literature on the commons tells us that ethnic land titling is one of the key components that is necessary to achieve environmental sustainability. And finally, others have said that ethnic land titling is crucial because it promotes uh, post-liberal citizenship regimes and multiculturalism. So as you can see, um, this research topic fits into all of these um, uh, areas. But because of time constraints, I will focus mainly on the literature on state building. Uh, the conventional wisdom of uh, ethnic land titling usually begins a story that goes something like this. Max Weber and Thiris Kapschko have told us the states seek control over people and territory. So the usual research question is then why states give up control by titling land to indigenous groups. The conventional answer, which is advanced by transnational constructivists, highlight external pressures from transnational activist networks, that is, international NGOs linked with domestic NGOs. Um, so according to that perspective, transnational activist networks, what I'm going to call TANS for short, are inspired by global normative advances, meaning international law, and shape ethnic land titling on the ground. So they have a famous Burmaran model, well, whereby TANs push state elites from below and from above 
uh, to title ethnic lands, and they do so by deploying name and shame media strategies, by making the World Bank to exert economic pressures on uh, state elites. Uh, so these state elites respond by titling land reluctantly. So in the story, uh, tans push state elites, and state elites respond. There are clear expectations about this perspective. Uh, constructivists expect states to um, forego territorial control. They also expect spatial uniformity, that is, indigenous land to follow where indigenous people are. So within countries, you should follow that. And then finally, um, constructivists expect a push and response dynamic, meaning that chance push and the state response. Now, I'm going to tell you what I found after um, 15 months of NSF-funded field work. I found that actually the state enhances territorial control by titling ethnic lands. That's because the state makes ethnic land titling compatible with the core institutional interest of ensuring control. State elites expand and intensify the role and the presence of the state in areas that are being subject to titling efforts. They introduce new, uniform institutions that reorganize indigenous society. So they fracture indigenous society and they build new institutions. Rather than simply recognizing indigenous modes of organization that existed before their intervention. So TANS expect that for the state just to recognize. But in fact, what the state does is fracture and rebuild. So when we look more closely, we see that state officials are actually strengthening their control by titling ethnic lands. Now, in terms of the spatial uniformity, um, transnational, uh, transnational constructivists expect tents to lead for indigenous people to claim lands so the state would respond wherever indigenous people are. Uh, but instead, what I found um, is a spatial clustering. Now, I've made some maps for you so that you can visually see uh, what I mean. In Nicaragua, the state has focused exclusively on titling ethnic lands. Let me see if I can get this done. Well, here on the eastern part of the territory, and has neglected indigenous land claims on the uh, rest of the country. So, just as looking at it, at this very simple descriptive map, you see that ethnic land titling does not necessarily correspond closely with indigenous people's claim. Now, we also see spatial clustering in the Brazilian case. On the map to the right, you will find Brazil. And in Brazil, the blue dots represent indigenous people that claim indigenous land. In the green are indigenous lands that have been titled. And in the yellow are those indigenous lands that the state has acknowledged that they will title in the future. So it's in the pipeline for titling. So you can also see that there is no close correspondence between indigenous people and indigenous lands. Now, some of you that were looking at this map were like, yeah, Gio, but look, you know that you have a lot of indigenous land in the Amazon region, which is that region over there. So I've made a map for you. And I've, and so if we only restrict our observations to the Amazon region, we find that, in the, that it, indeed, indigenous lands and indigenous people land claims don't necessarily comport to each other. The blue dots, again, are indigenous people that claim land. The green are indigenous lands. And the yellow are um, indigenous lands in the pipeline. So what we learn from these maps is that Transnational activist networks, or TAN, activism alone is not driving ethnic land titling. Something else must be going on. So my argument is that ethnic land titling is not about where indigenous people claim land, but where the state wants to be. In my account, ethnic land titling is a tool, is a tool of state building. So state elites title ethnic lands to reinforce state power over the hinterlands, and incorporate indigenous people that resist the state into the modern nation state. Ethnic land titling is beneficial for state builders because it serves to manage far-flung regions in the short term and ensure nation building policies in the long term. So to be sure, I, just, I don't want to uh, create the impression that transnational uh, activist networks are not doing anything. They are. The, the variable matters sometimes. But what I'm saying is that state interest matters, uh, matters most of the time. 
By state interest, I mean the institutional interest of state elites to mark the presence of the state and ensure control over people and territory in peripheral regions. So in my account, I posit that internal threats uh, and external threats trigger the state's need to reclaim territorial power. So I highlight a privilege omitted variable in the literature, which is internal threats, um, while considering also external uh, threats. But in my fame work, I conceptualize these variables out as security challenges. That's because both of these variables jeopardize the institutional interest of state officials to control territory. So I argue that before these threats arise, state officials can take time to not, uh, to disregard or can neglect areas or regions within the territory. But as soon as, as soon as these threats reach a critical threshold, they start paying attention and they title ethnic lands in a way that enhances their state interest. So notice that in my account, internal threats or uh, external threats have a role to play, but state interest has a, a huge crucial mediating um, effect and it is state interest that tells us why and how implementation um, happens. So I take the interest of state elites to control territory seriously, and I place it at the center for the analysis. In my framework, I expect the following patterns. When ethnic land titling is a reaction to internal threats, state elites are motivated to ensure territorial control. I expect them to title ethnic lands where the threat originates, but not where there is no threat. When it's a reaction to external threats, uh, which is the process that constructivism emphasizes, state elites take it as a huge challenge to state power. That's because transnational activist networks, what they want is indi full indigenous self-determination. That means the ability to govern internal political, economic, and cultural affairs without state intervention. What I'm saying is that state elites ensure that they can um, safeguard the institutional interests of the state and create new intermediary institutions in order to control indigenous popula the indigenous population. So in my uh, state-centric model, uh, without the presence of state interest, internal external threats uh, can have a weak uh, effect on implementation outcomes. The central idea is that when these uh, factors reach a critical threshold, state officials put their money, put their hands in the pot and ensure that uh, ethnic land titling can actually serve their purposes. So this is a story about the state ensuring that the institution of the modern state continues in the long term, but most importantly, that they can manage territory and intensify their control over people in the short term. So to test my proposition alongside with the rival um, uh, hypotheses, I chose three case studies, Brazil, Honduras, and Nicaragua. Today I'll just talk about Nicaragua and Brazil, but we can discuss Honduras later. Um, these case studies allow me to vary key causal factors between countries, as well as vary the intensity of state interest uh, within countries. Importantly, I keep constant on a huge important institutional factor, which is International Human Rights Law, that is, International Labor Organization's Convention No. 169, which talks about indigenous people's rights to land. Um, before I head to the case studies, I just want to tell you a little bit about my research design. Mine is a theory building exercise, so I support my argument with the result of a lot of field work, and I actually went to 24 different urban and rural sites in all of the three countries. And for my project, I collected both qualitative and quantitative data. On the qualitative side, I conducted archival research in the main centers of national power, like Brasilia, Tegucigalpa, and Managua. But I also went to data repositories in the rural areas, like Bilui and Bluefields. I carried out about 110 semi-structured interviews with expert and key decision makers. So for instance, I interviewed President Collor of Brazil, former President Collor of Brazil, I also interviewed uh, the big uh, decision maker for the military during the military during the administration of Fernando Franco, uh, Rubens Baina Denise, he's a general. Um, I also interviewed the former and current president of 
uh, Honduras and indigenous leaders and indigenous people in general. In addition to that, I went to uh, seven different political events and I participated as an observer. Um, importantly, I went with the Brazilian military to the Amazon frontier region uh, on a week-long inspection trip. So I interviewed tons of military at the site where they work and where they engage with indigenous communities. And I also went to the um, Honduran Mosquitia with the military and the World Bank. Uh, for the quantitative side, I administered four survey experiments, one to, eat to national representatives in each legislature um, of the countries, of the three countries, plus uh, to military officers uh, at the National Defense University of Honduras. In addition to that, I built a geospatial database of ethnic land titling. I did that by going into government archives, taking pictures of the titling files, and transferring that information by hand into a geospatial database using ArcGIS. So now to the case studies. Uh, today I support my finding with the result of a field work in 17 sites. So here in the red, I'm not sure if you guys see the red, but in the red are um, the location of my uh, field work sites. And I'll talk about how Nicaragua, uh, in Nicaragua state interest mediates internal threats and in Brazil, state interest mediates external pressure. So in Nicaragua, I interviewed the president's uh, inner circle and the intellectual fathers of the ethnic land titling program. I also interviewed Brooklyn Rivera. This is the main uh, political leader for ethnic communities in the East. Nicaragua had experienced war over the allocation of land and the way that people managed natural resources in the 1980s. Uh, the war was created by the Sandinistas. And it was because the Sandinistas, like any typical revolutionary, wanted to incorporate the part of the country, the eastern part of the country, to the more developed west. And what they did is that they came up with this land reform program, whereby they would allocate small plots of communal land, like cooperatives, uh, in the east. Well, that program really challenged the structure of rural power in the east, really challenged it to the point that Brooklyn Rivera led an insurrection, an insurrection that almost dismembered the state. So Commander Ortega, in the mid-1980s, engineered the passage of a law that recognized ECPR formally in the Constitution um, and that um, prevented the dismemberment of the state, so the decomposition of the state. In the 1990s, he lost power, famously, uh, and uh, the administrations that came after that ensured not to touch the East because they, they just don't want it to create any problems in the East. But in 2006, uh, Daniel Ortega was re-elected, and the issue of ethnic land titling and the issues of the uh, indigenous communities of the East became part of the national discussion again. So, uh, as soon as Daniel Ortega got into power in January 2007, um, he prioritized the ethnic land titling program. So what I learned after speaking with the president's inner circle was that the Sandinista title ethnic lands to ensure territorial unity and internal political order. For instance, the president's top political advisor, his name is Polo Kistakeli, um, said to me that ethnic land titling is a fundamental pillar for national unity and that it serves to prevent conflict and that it is a way to govern the country. Commander uh, Lumberto Cambo, a military commander in the 1980s and the top the political decision maker for Eastern Affairs today also stressed that ethnic land titling guarantees territorial unity and that without respect for communal lands, the ethnic communities of the East rebel. So what do they mean by that? Well, the Sandinista elite was worried about violent conflict over land in the East. So to prevent internal turmoil, the Sandinista designed and titled large multicultural communal land blocks in the East, the wars under the 1980s, in a rapid and systematic fashion. In just nine years, they finished the ethnic land titling program. By the time they were done, one third of Nicaragua's national territory is titled as an indigenous land. 
Note that the government has completely ignored the indigenous land claims from the people in the West. So I argue that the Sandinista elites design and title large multicultural communal land blocks to deactivate internal threat there. So it's not that they're responding to town activism and that they want to give land, uh, the land to the mosquito, the land that they claim as their ancestral homeland. It's more that they want to neutralize the, whatever uh, threat that the mosquito may pose. Now on to Brazil. In Brazil, I want to uh, tell, argue that state interest mediates external threats. In Brazil, um, I interviewed uh, President Fernando Collor himself. This is the president that made the decision on extending uh, ethnic land title in the Amazon. So what he told me was that in the 1990s there was this huge conflict over uh, the Yanomami. The Yanomami are an ethnic group native to the Brazilian-Venezuelan border. The Amazonian borderlands have been normally part of Brazil, but were not really incorporated into the, in, into the state, into the modern state. So it was basically a neglected region. And transnational activists in that region were demanding full territorial autonomy for the ethnic groups. So nobody could actually interact with them, not even uh, the military. So the military would have to ask permission. But the military had this long tradition of titling small pockets of land to incorporate people and assimilate them into the Brazilian nation state. Um, and they insisted on retaining control, military control of indigenous lands, especially if they overlap with the frontier zone. The frontier zone is an area created by law where the military has full jurisdiction. So President Kohler, what he did was to revamp, so in, in reaction to transnational activism, uh, President Kohler uh, revamped indigenous land titling that existed in the past. In the past, the military couldn't access indigenous land. In this new iteration of the indigenous land titling program, the military could enter and have full access into indigenous lands. And only after doing that, he said, okay, fine, let's give land to the indigenous communities. So they used the power of the military to have double ownership of indigenous lands. And they did that to guarantee international uh, unity, uh, sorry, territorial unity. What's really important is that uh, political elites, instead of actually enhancing the power of the indigenous communities to govern themselves according to their customs, what they did is that they subordinated indigenous rights to the political interest of the nation state. So generals that are stationed in the frontier zone can access and act inside indigenous land without any authorization. So General Antonio Manuel de Barros, who you see here pictured, um, this is in the Amazon frontier region. He told me that the military have, do, do not need to have any authorization to be able to act within indigenous lands. So I argued that President Kohler in effect created a new type of indigenous land model that serves as a political strategy to secure military control over otherwise non-incorporated localities without arousing international scorn. So based on this new titling model, indigenous land have been concentrated in the frontier zone, which is here in red. That's the frontier zone that they created in 1979. And this map I show um, also in, in, in the darker spot, I don't know, I'm not sure if you can see it, but in the frontier zone, that if those indigenous lands overlap with the frontier zones, it's four times more likely that they're going to get approval by the president. If those indigenous lands overlap with the frontier zone and have mineral wealth, like uranium, niobium, gold, or diamonds, they're 13 times more likely to have presidential approval. So I've controlled for a number of factors, believe me, I did it all, to be able to show this result. So we can talk about well, all those controls in the Q&A. In this 3D map, you can see the spatial clustering clearly. The higher the peak, the more indigenous land titles there are. Here, the peak situates itself in the northern frontier zone. So in the literature of ethnic land titling, um, indigenous lands are synonymous with ethnic autonomy. 
with indigenous self-determination and are widely seen as a result of transnational activist networks. My research project shows that internal threat is a crucial causal variable that has been disregarded in the literature. Most importantly, I show that state interests have been omitted, but that it's very important for us to see that state interests are a very crucial mediating factor that tells us how and why ethnic land titling happens. The institutional interest of government elites to ensure the state's presence and function in peripheral outlying regions is fundamental for us to take into consideration. So today I showed you that a state interest mediate internal threats is in Nicaragua and is a crucial necessary condition in, um, in Brazil when it's mediating external threats. So state interests substantively change the core of the ethnic land title model in both cases. In the end, even in Brazil, a country that is very vulnerable to international public opinion because they have 60% of the Amazonia, um, ethnic land titling is a crucial part of the story. So in conclusion, state interest tells how and why ethnic land titling happens. And because of that, indigenous people are actually not getting more power. It's the state that is enhancing its power in these areas where there was no state to begin with. So there's a project, uh, it's a book manuscript. I'm working on um, a, a, book, a book workshop for the next spring and I would love for people uh, of class to go and participate in the book workshop on April 26th of next uh, year. Um, it would be amazing, especially for the comparative politics reading group because these people are amazing and giving comments. Um, I also have five research articles in the pipeline. Um, one of them we discussed at the comparative politics reading groups and then other articles. Today, I am um, telling you about my theory building, my main essential article, uh, showing the cases of Brasil and Nicaragua. And I would love to get your feedback and comments on the, you know, the general gist of the story, the theoretical propositions that I make, and any other questions that you might have. And it's interesting because this ties into my second book project, which is about the effect of ethnic land titling. So the military and the state is wanting to do all this, and I'm saying that's the reason why they do it. So my next book project is going to be like, are they successful? Did they, did it work? You know, is this a strategy that they can uh, say, yes, you know, this is something that works in the long run, and we don't regret doing it. So that's the core of my talk, and now I move on to the questions and answers section. Um, before we actually do move on, I want to show you a picture. This is in the Amazon Frontier Zone. I went with the military, I told you, uh, on a week-long inspection trip. You really can't, this military officer over here is showing where we are. This is called Cabeza de Cachorro. It's in the middle of nowhere, and the only way you can access there is through military planes, because it's a military area. This is where indigenous people, this is a site of an indigenous land that's been titled by the president. And in that site, there is an MRI. So this is a picture of that MRI that I took in the middle of nowhere in the Brazilian Amazon. Now with that uh, little uh, idea about state building in the modern age, um, I turn it to you. Let me see if you... <laughs> Any questions? Yes, Scott. Um, I'm sorry, I was late. I'm going to have to leave early. But, um... <laughs> I, since I heard it at the Comparative Politics Reading Group the other day, um, the thing that I've been thinking about since that time that I still don't really understand is the different conjunction of interests amongst the people who live in these areas. And one of the things we talked about that night was the difference between um, indigenous communities and peasants themselves. And so how, what are they portraying to the state and are they happy with the way that the, the state are they getting what they what they asked for? Because they obviously were asking, you know, a lot of, some of these groups were asking for more more rights and were ignored. So some of them should be happy about it. But you, if I understood correctly the other night, you said that some of them are, don't like what's going on. They didn't because it didn't work out the way. So I'm, I, I'm confused on how that all works. So Great. I mean, excuse mm -hmm. me again if I missed partly how you explained that today. Okay. Uh, so should I? Should I take more questions and then answer? I'll just answer it right now. Usually yeah, so, yeah, yeah, one by one. So thank you for that question. Um, so yeah, there are different interests uh, in this story. So for those people that um, have demanded for indigenous territory, they're not necessarily happy with what they got. 
because they were expecting the, rec the state recognition of their customs and the way of uh, the usual way of organizing civ uh, indigenous society at the local level. And what they got was actually a system whereby um, new institutions, so new traditional authorities are being put in place, and there is an intermediary between the local people and the central government. So for example, indigenous people in Nicaragua have told me that they wanted to have their customary institutions be recognized formally by the state, but instead of that, they got new institutions that reorganized uh, their, their society. They said, we want this because we, don't, we want to dispense with traditional parties, because traditional parties uh, sow seeds of discord within our communities. But what they got was a superimposing institution that's, uh, uh, that's being manipulated by the central government through, through, uh, through the party. So it's like a new form of clientelism. So indigenous people themselves are not happy. Um, in addition to that, uh, people that self-identify as peasants, so that their main way of identification is not on, cultural, on a cultural basis or on an ethnic basis, but as on an economic basis as peasants, really dislike this. Because now this new traditional authority, what they call traditional authority, which is not traditional, um, dictates where to land, how to manage the resources in that land, and does not allow within the indigenous territory um, individual private property. So peasants don't like it either. Um, who really likes it are the generals and the state, because they think that this is a way of fracturing indigenous society and preventing, in the Nicaraguan case, um, collective action, so that they can resist state domination. Yeah. Uh, you showed us a map where the, the indigenous groups got land in Nicaragua and Brazil. And the, these indigenous groups in the south of Brazil and the west in Nicaragua, do they, what are their reactions to this? Because some indigenous groups get land, the others not, and they are protest, they just accept the reality. Yeah, that's a very good question. So there is this, the conventional wisdom of the transnational activist networks work it's not only in academia, it's actually abroad too. So what they do in the Nicaraguan case, they are um, always grabbing International Labor Organization Convention 169 and saying, we demand our indigenous territory. And these people over here um, have peaceful demonstration and marches in order to get indigenous territory, right? The interesting thing is that Nicaragua is very small, and from there, you know, I know it's really small. <laughs> But people from the east and the west don't really talk, right? So that's that's sad. Um, in the case of Brazil, the Guarani Guaranier uh, is the largest indigenous group in Brazil. The Guarani. I'm sorry that I can show you here, but I'm just gonna point. The Guarani are here, and these people you've seen, you don't really see the indigenous lands that are being titled. And what they do is that they do um, collective action peacefully, you know, they march and they demand ILO 169 implementation, but in addition to that, they do it um, with violence. So they go into some indigenous, uh, what they claim as their indigenous ancestral homeland, and they squat there and they, you know, demand uh, the recognition of indigenous territory. Um, again, in Brazil, it's kind of interesting because you have approximately 250 different cultures in Brazil, indigenous cultures in Brazil, and the people here, the Guarani and the Kaigan who are here, are the most strong in terms of uh, um, indigenous civil society, but also they're the most repressed. So it's, it's actually very, very, it's a very good question. Thank you for that. Yes. Uh, so what do you think are the differences that may be caused by the size of the country. So for example, you mentioned Nicaragua is smaller and Brazil is a large country and they, like the state, title land in the frontier region. But Nicaragua, so it seems that there are two very different logic going on in these two countries. Uh, 
and yeah, there are two variables that drive it, but the same logic of the state is constant in both countries. Now, for the Nicaragua state, uh, Nicaragua is small, so it's easier for me to test statistical significance of the size of the territory, and if it makes any difference in Brazil, because Brazil is such a huge country, right? The Amazon region is the size of Australia, so to just have an idea of how big we're talking about. And I have a nifty little stats table that I can show you. Um, I can show you the result of that. Second, let me just get there. Oh, here it is. All right, size. So this is Brazil. So I'm doing an event history analysis, um, controlling for spatial autocorrelation, right? And in Brazil, I put in the size of the indigenous land to see, and, and you know, if that is something that's significant. What I found throughout the models, even if I'm controlling for mineral wealth or if I'm controlling for agricultural potential, is that um, <coughs> the size really doesn't matter. The size of the indigenous territory that's being allocated doesn't really matter. So there's no effect on the size. Is that the question? No. Uh, part of, I think, okay. another part is the size of the country. Right. And it's, it seems to me it's easier to control Nicaragua from the center than control frontier region in Brazil. And I think I have a second question yeah. to follow up is, uh, you mentioned Guarani in southern Brazil. And I'm wondering, so, they seem to be similar, because they seem to adopt similar tactics as indigenous people in Nicaragua in the east. And how do you see why why the Nicaraguan central government uh, give lands to uh, Nicaragua indigenous people, but not Brazilian government giving land to to Guaranis? That's that's a thank you for that question. So let me just address the size of the country bit. Mm -hmm. Um, territorially, Nicaragua is smaller, right? And the state uses party officials as, as intermediaries. In Brazil, Brazil is much bigger, and the state uses military um, installations to ensure presence and to govern indigenous society. So when I went to the Missouri, uh, Brazilian frontier region, you have one military post every 500 kilometers. But in addition to that, you have military bases dispersed throughout indigenous lands. And all of these was done without, obviously, the authorization of the indigenous communities or without even the authorization of the National Congress. So the Brazilian military really has a lot of jurisdiction over indigenous lands. So that's on the size part of the country bit. Uh, so what's the difference between the Guarani and Misquito? Well, the Guarani, what they do is dispersed moments of violent collective action. But the Mesquito nearly won a war, an, eth an ethnic national war, that fractured the state. So the legacy of insurrection and that thing that you say, we almost got it. You know, if we try again, maybe we can do it. It's substantively different, it's distinct. So, so the state in Nicaragua really has to take this seriously. So just to give you a bit of uh, background information, in 2005, just before uh, the Nerotea regained power, and this is the guy that made the war, right? There was a study conducted about collective action in the East, where the mosquitoes are, and they said repeatedly that they had this legacy, collective legacy of having a mosquito kingdom, this is their, their ancestral homeland, and a collective legacy of the Sandinistas the Sandinistas trampling on their ancestral homeland. So land is a very contentious issue, and you know, it can spark a fire very quickly in the Nicaraguan case. So more questions or comments? All right, so if that was it, thank you so much for um, coming over. And I would love to get some comments and feedback from you guys. Thank you, Jim, for coming. Yes.